Okay, yes. Our special segment today, we're going to look at breakouts because we're getting close to the end of the fantasy hockey calendar, which means we're running out of chances to sort of look ahead to next year. And I want to just hint at some players we'll be reaching on next season in drafts. Some of them are obvious, some of them are not, but they all have, a, a I think, a purpose for being included on this list. So let's talk about breakouts and more specifically, guys that I'm going to reach an extra round or two on next year. All right, well, let's start off with a guy that no one's ever heard of before, and that is Connor Bedard. <laughs> yes, Connor Bedard, as I put in brackets, lol, lols with a Z, lols. But I'll explain why he counts as a breakout. Everyone knows he's been very good. He's been almost a point per game as a rookie, but I think it's actually masking how good he's been and how much better he's going to be next year. I've hinted at it on the show before, but I'm going to do it a little bit more specifically here. So there are two 18-year-olds in the past 37 years who have averaged more points than Connor Bedard this season in the NHL. They are Sidney Crosby and Connor McDavid. That just tells you the company he's keeping. As I've said before, both of those players had that level in the rookie season. Both of those players went absolutely supernova in year two. Both of those players won the Hart and the Art Ross in year two. The competition, of course, is really steep for Bedard. I'm not saying he's going to win the Art Ross because he's overlapping with McDavid still in his prime. But I think we are going to see something like 45, 50 goals, 100, 105 points from Connor Bedard in year two. I think he's going to be a first round caliber player next season based on what he's shown already. Also very important, the Blackhawks are committed to making a much better team next year. We know they're going to add another significant piece. It could be Max, Macklin Celebrini. We don't know who it's going to be, but it's going to be an impact player at the draft this year, depending on how the draft lottery balls play out. You have Frankie Nazar. Nazar? Nazar? Nazar. Nazar. I call him Nazar. Yeah. Yep. So there's a chance that he'll be turning pro. Add him to the frame next year. You're going to get someone like Kevin Korczynski getting better. The supporting cast is going to get better. We already know the Chicago Blackhawks. It's been implied, reported by our own Frank Cervalli, that they might be more aggressive in the offseason too in pursuing upgrades. I know it's something, Stephen, you've been really suggesting they do. Uh, so if you add up all those factors, developmentally, Connor Bedard is on this very similar path to Crosby and McDavid, and he's on a team that's going to, I think, be much better next year in terms of the supporting cast around him. He's already doing this with absolutely no one helping him. So next year, I think you're going to see a huge jump. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't rank him 30th. I think he could be a top 15 player next year, and I'm okay with anyone who wants to reach, even take him near the end of the first round next year. The Blackhawks should have gone all in on Jake Gensel this year. Uh, they have seven picks in the first three rounds. Why not just use some of them? Uh, they've got two first-rounders in each of the next two drafts. Uh, it's a while before they go get out of the top three rounds without significantly more picks than they started with. So I thought they should have been a bit more aggressive at the deadline, but whatever. Uh, the second one here is Shane Pinto, a guy that nobody was picking at the start of the year because he wasn't playing. But now that he's playing and playing very well, I like this one. Yeah, it's been an interesting uh, trajectory for Shane Pinto, who a couple of years ago was a pretty popular prospect. Uh, coming through the college route, I think North Dakota, wasn't he North Dakota? Same school, same yep. school as Jonathan Taves. And of course, the value went in the toilet, uh, especially this year, the gambling scandal. And it's really fascinating what's happened. And it wasn't just because of the Josh Norris injury. Even before the injury, we saw Shane Pinto overtaking him on the depth chart, taking over as the number two center. And now, Norris has not just been hurt again, but it's another shoulder injury. So his future is very much in flux. And I think Shane Pinto is positioned to permanently leapfrog Norris in the pecking order. Uh, and I just think he's shown a lot of promise. Shooting the puck roughly three times a game, 25 points in 32 games. Project that over a full season. It's close to, give or take, a 60-point player. And yes, Ottawa, they perennially, perennially disappoint but uh, they're not necessarily disappointments in fantasy. So I think that Pinto is primed for a career year next year. I could see him getting 25 goals, 65 points, something like that. Good. I, I like that one. Like Pinto, I've been a big fan of since they drafted him. A guy that knows how to shoot, knows how to win faceoffs, knows how to just be so effective both ends of the ice. He's dealt with injuries. Obviously, getting suspended this year didn't help. But I think that when he's healthy, he's... He's one of the best young guys the Ottawa Senators have. And that's good because, you know, their rebuild hasn't exactly worked the way they were kind of hoping it would. But 
Pinto is starting to look like the guy we knew he could be. So if Josh Norris can't ever stay healthy anymore, that's a bummer. But you know, Shane Pinto's looking there. Remember a couple of years ago we were talking about Colin White, like just how good he could have been for the Senators. Had this great, you know, forty-one point season that one year, and I was like, well, let's see what he could do. And now it's like, I think he's on Montreal right now. So. Yeah, Colin White, when he was coming up the college ranks, uh, was compared by a lot of people to Patrice Bergeron in terms of his like skill set, what what people hoped he was going to be, but it has not played out that way. It's a mystery what happened because, again, the talent was there. I just I don't know what happened. Thomas Harley, we've talked about him a few times on this show, but uh, a guy that I think we both think could potentially be in the Four Nations face-off roster consideration for Team Canada next year. Yes, Thomas Harley. And wait, before I get to Thomas Harley, I want to tell a really weird story about Colin White because it just sounds like I dreamt this. But when he was a rookie, uh, I did a story when I was with Hockey News uh, interviewing a bunch of the Sens rookies. But Ottawa, which was funny, had the idea for me to interview them all at the same time. So it was me in a closed room with Colin White, Brady Kachuk, Max Lajoie, and then Thomas Cheval was a sophomore at the time. And I don't know why we were talking about the floss and who could do the floss dance? And and they all they all said Whitey. And then Colin White got up, and the rest of us just sat there in the silent room while Colin White did the floss. <laughs> it was really weird, but uh, it was memorable. So I just wanted to share that. Um, okay, <laughs> it was so weird, but I gained respect for Colin White. Okay, Thomas Harley. So obviously he's been already one of the breakout players of the year. Fifteen goals, forty points. He's playing with Mira Heiskin. He's showing so much promise. Five on five plus 20 goal differential with him out there. This kid is a stud. And yes, you could argue the breakouts already happened. But to me, it's like, well, this is just him getting his feet wet and establishing himself as a full time NHLer. Like, is this the floor? Uh, Dallas, we know, is a powerhouse. They're set up to continue to be a powerhouse for years to come because now they're gray beards. You know, Tyler Sagan, Jamie Ben, those guys are now the secondary group. And you have their superstars, Jason Robertson, Heiskanen, you have Jake. Jake Ott and Jerupe Hintz. You have Logan Stankov and Wyatt Johnson. This team is stacked, man. And Thomas Harley is going to be a big part of that. Super fertile fantasy environment. First round pedigree. He just has everything going for him. And I think we could see him become an elite fantasy defenseman next year. Yep, I really like that one. I, I was not super high on Harley when he was a Mississauga Steelhead. I just wasn't sure he had a huge, super high ceiling. I'm glad that he's looking as good as he is, though, because, you know, that just makes the Dallas Stars even more fun to watch, like with how much talent that team has and how they continue to find these, you know, defensive stalwart guys. And one that I'm not sure how confident they were in, in him for a couple of years, but the way he's playing this year, it's like that confidence in himself. It's it's there 100 mm-hmm. percent. Uh, next up, a guy that, again, I'm so happy is looking as good as he is. Marco Rossi, just because, you know, I know it's been a few years now, but that COVID loss season, that was a huge bummer for him, given how much momentum he was carrying from that great OHL season. But now, just after a couple of years in the AHL, that just wasn't really working. He's looked pretty good this year. He's actually been one of the best rookies the Minnesota Wild have ever had. That's right. And I agree. It's fun that we get to talk about him as someone to be bullish on because he obviously spent several years appearing on kind of sleeper lists or long-term keeper lists, but he wasn't putting it all together. Finally got an extended look in the NHL last year. It was an unmitigated disaster. He could just could not find the net. Didn't look NHL ready when he got a shot, despite looking good in the preseason. And then this year, it finally just sticks. 20 goals as a rookie. Very exciting. And he's shown some good two-way ability, which is great. Great way to earn your coach's trust. And if you look at the long-term setup for the Wild, yes, Joel Erickson Eck having a career year, and yes, Ryan Hartman has often been the center for Kirill Kaprizov, but I still think the Wild's hope long-term has always been that Marco Rossi can be their number one center and play with Kaprizov. And he's had some opportunities to do that this year. And based on what he's shown as a rookie in his first full year, I think he's on the path now to becoming that player for them. So I think there's potential for him to make a major leap next year. So he's a 20-goal player this year, but he could be a 30-goal player. He could be a 65-point, 70-point player next year if things break his way. So good on you, Marco. It's nice to see you on your feet and with all the crazy health stuff behind you now. Offensively, he's been quite inconsistent, and I wrote about him in my recent Calder update mm-hmm. where he, I think he only had four points last year or last month. It was a quiet month for him. The big thing going forward for him is just continuously improving his two-way play because that was something where – when he was drafted, you know, a small guy wasn't very physical. How was he going to get around that? And a lot of it was 
you know, just how good he was at both ends of the ice. And he's already looking fantastic in that regard there. So he does a lot of things that don't get rewarded on the score sheet. And eventually the score sheet stuff will show up. Um, he showed last year in the AHL that he wasn't just a junior point producer. He could produce at the uh, the pro level too. So I like his future there. I'm a big fan of him, and I'm happy to see him playing as well as he has. Uh, and then to finish it off, let's go with Quinton Byfield. Yeah, this one is really interesting to me um, because the pedigree with Byfield, the hype when he was first a prospect in that 2020 draft class, even back then it was sort of like, okay, this kid is really raw. He has a really wide range of outcomes. He could be a bust, but he could also be Eric Lindros, and it's going to take him time to sort of find himself. And, of course, we had that freak broken ankle uh, at the beginning of the season a couple years back. That set him back on his developmental timeline. But he finally stuck as a first-line player last year. I wasn't that high in him going into the year because he had one of those kind of like Robert Thomas, Mark Stone profiles where he doesn't shoot the puck that much, doesn't register that many hits. He's going to be a source of assists, but that's all he was really showing. And that kind of was how the year started, which is why in the Keeper League I actually traded him away. Um, but he sort of found the beast now. And I think we're starting to see that major potential be realized. He's shooting the puck a lot more now, roughly a couple shots per game, close to a hit per game. He's broken out as a first line player, but now it's like, wait, is Quinton Byfield going to become a superstar? I think it's still in play. And if you look at players like Joe Thornton or Vincent LeCavalier or Todd Bertuzzi back in the day, these big, big guys that just took a while to grow into their bodies. It's more common. That's the adage for defensemen like Chara, Pronger, Hedman, but it applies to some really big guys uh, who are forwards too. And I feel like Byfield is growing into his body now, and maybe the sky's the limit. Like this guy could be a point per game player. I'm thinking 80 point player next year for the Kings. Yeah, I'm a big fan. And, you know, I got to see the OHL Cup um, this past weekend, and there's a prospect that kind of has a very similar build to him, and that is Ethan Belchett, who Oakville Rangers player. He just won the tournament, and uh, a lot of scouts were kind of saying there's some similarities there and how they, you know, physically were just a dominant player that age group. I guess the big question is how do you take that to the next level where everyone else is typically a little stronger than, you know, a 16 year old or anybody in the OHL. And uh, I think that it took Byfield a bit to figure that out, but um, he was one of the best under 16 players I'd ever seen. And that's just because nobody wanted to go near him. And now that he's figuring how to use that to his advantage, uh, it looks pretty good. You had two bonus picks here. Who were they? Yes. So if we're just looking ahead, it's something just to kind of uh, make a note of uh, in terms of goalies to reach on next year, depending on how the offseason plays out. So if the Calgary Flames trade Jacob Markstrom, make sure you're all in on Dustin Wolf. And if the Nashville Predators trade UC Saros, make sure you're all in on Yaroslav Askarov. Or if the Nashville Predators trade Yaroslav Askarov, make sure you're all in on Yaroslav Askarov. I think it's becoming less and less likely that the Predators trade Saros just based on how they've surged in the second half. But just keep an eye on those two goalies, Wolf and Askarov. They're two of the best goalie prospects in the world. And I just think there's a nice opportunity for their roles to change. Another one, of course, to, to remember is Jesper Wallstedt in Minnesota. If Marc-Andre Fleury retires after the season, which is entirely possible, it's going to be Wallstedt's net to share with Gustafson. He's also an elite goalie prospect. So just keep those names in mind. As you said before, Stephen, we're in a really nice age, a really major surge of high, high, high end goalie prospects right now. So these guys could be big time different difference makers if they uh, get the right opportunities. I'll throw one totally crazy wild card out there with Detroit and, and their kind of crazy goalie situation. What about Sebastian Cosa as a backup next year? You never mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. so, anyways, uh, he's having a good year this year. I'm, I'm really happy to see that. So I love seeing goalies do well. Um, I like seeing all prospects do well, actually. There's nobody I want to see fail, but uh, there's that. 